Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. I don't know um, what you're hoping to receive tonight. I think we all come for different reasons and I don't know whether some of you want to hear something that's going to give you a bit of hope to get through the next week. Um, some of you just want to get with your friends, which is lovely. Um, for me, I like to learn stuff. <laughs> I don't make any apologies, I love to learn. So I read a lot. And uh, when Jenny was talking about the internet and how, what that's done for us all, it's really quite amazing, isn't it? You know, you've got access to stuff now that... I remember years ago when Anthony used to preach and he used to get up early on a Sunday morning. All he had was a concordance and it was made out of really that fine rice, was it rice paper? And all the pages used to be so thin that they'd stick together and it was really quite awful. And if he wanted to find anything, even in the Bible, he would have to think of a word, the word and then he'd have to look for it. And, uh, and then you'd plough through. I mean, imagine how many pages there would be with certain words until he finally found it and then he would use it, you know. And I think, heck, we've got Bible programs now and... You can, you can just type in something into Google and it comes up somebody's opinion about this and that. And isn't it a wow? That's a wow. And I just love it. I think, oh, I'm grateful that I was born in this day and age. Because if you think about it, you know, I mean, I'm probably digressing, but I'm just going to go with it tonight. By the way, I have no um, title for this. So somebody's going to have to be real clever and come up with a title. But, you know, maybe it's... Somebody will be real clever and come up with a title. Forgot what I was going to say. What had I just said before I got sidetracked? What? Oh, yeah, because there's just so much, so many, much to connect with and learn. And I just think it's so amazing. I think I've got sidetracked there, but it doesn't matter. What? Oh, anyway. Um, I thought, I love to learn. And so some of you are not interested in like coming on a Wednesday night when we might do a Bible study. So that means that if we want anything of what we're learning to be brought, we have to do it on a Saturday night. And you might think, well, is it the right time to do it? It's, that's, the, that's questionable. But then if, if we want you guys to get a bit of a, a feel of the revelation that's come, we have no option but to bring it tonight. And some of you might say, well, that was a bit deep or what have you. We have no option. Because if you won't come on a Wednesday to a Bible study, then we have to do it now. And some people say to me, oh, I'd love a Bible study where we learn. I'm thinking, you won't come. You tell me you want it, you won't come. Because I've proved it. We do put them on and you don't come. Anyway, I'm not trying to be, be unkind, but I'm just trying to set a little bit of the scene for tonight. Because some of the things that I might say, you might feel uncomfortable with. But here's the thing, like we say in this house... This isn't, I'm not telling you what to think. I'm not telling you that my view or what I have come to understand is right. But I'm offering it to you so you can go away and have a think. Come on, you've got a brain of your own. You can use it. Now, some of you don't want to use that brain because you want somebody to think for you. And uh, Jenny said something last week about, um, you know, the Mona Lisa versus the fountain. Come on, be honest. How many since she said that last week has that come up in your lives? It's been unbelievable. On MasterChef, it was on, and various people have said, I'd never heard of it, but I've heard it three times since then. Now, it was interesting that the week before Jenny spoke, it was um, Amps last weekend, on the Sunday morning. I, we love Sundays at our house because it, we haven't got to be anywhere. That is just wonderful. I absolutely adore it. And it's the time when Anth and I... Um, and for those who don't know, Anthony's uh, senior leader here. And uh, we uh, use Sunday mornings to talk, and it's just great. And it was interesting. Now, the conversation, this is before you spoke, and I haven't mentioned this to you, Jenny, but we were talking about the fact that what the Rock Church is, uh, and I mean, Angus and Kath aren't here tonight, but uh, um, Alice is, so she'll relate to this. Um, 
We were talking about the rock being a goat's milk church in a predominantly cow's milk market. Now, do you get what I mean by that? Because if you think about it, how, how and I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. Isn't it awesome that it might be a small part of the market, but you hit it and you've got a fantastic thing going. Look, look at what's happened with um, Angus and Kath and, and the success of that, that farm. But actually, it's a very small part of the market. It's growing, but you could say that it's small. Now, the interesting thing is, is if you think about it, how do you get onto goat's milk as a rule? I don't think anybody just goes into the, the supermarket and thinks, I'm going to switch. Do they? I mean, the, some might, but it's rare. People switch for a reason. If you've got an intolerance, if there's something going on in, in your, your, your body, you might be told, get off cow's milk, go on to goat's milk. So we do it for a reason. And really in this house, I would have to say that we have become this goat's milk church because we had to get off the other thing because it actually wasn't doing us a lot of good. And so most of us here have actually had a bit of an encounter with something that said, do you know what? I need something different and I need something to sit better on my stomach when it comes to our understanding of God, our understanding of the Bible, our understanding of Jesus, our understanding of the cross. Some of you are thinking, what? No, I haven't got a problem. That's fine. You don't have to have it. But some of us have. And the journey that we have gone, just like what uh, Jenny was talking about last week, having to recognise she showed the Mona Lisa, yes it's art, and then she showed the fountain, yes it's art, but there was a lot of people who don't think it's art, and they struggle with it, and we're having the same issue in a sense here, because you see, we have departed from a common narrative, and when you depart from a common narrative, you end up being in a smaller percentage of the majority, a bit like cow's milk versus the uh, goat's milk. Is this making sense? I hope so. And Jenny actually talked about, um, she, she asked three questions. It was, what is art? How do we know? Who decides what gets included? That's very good, good questions. And she likened them to the question that we've been asking, what is the church? How do we know? Who decides who gets included? Great, isn't it? But you see, I want to actually ask uh, a different question. What is the Bible? <laughs> I'm just hiding. What is the Bible? How do we know? And who decides what gets included? Now, some of you are thinking, heck, is she going to tear apart our sacred book? Nope. Not going to do now like that. But I'm going to ask the questions because it's actually very interesting. You know, there's a word that's called the canon of Scripture. And when you actually get down to it, it's only actually been put together for 500 years. When you think about it, you've got probably 2,000 years to, to Christ, and then before then you've got back to whatever it was, the beginning of creation. Yet actually the Bible as it stands now has only actually been intact for about 500 years. Now, don't you find that interesting? Actually, to be able to, to, to hold it. Now, the canon, which is really interesting, it's, it's developed, and I find this... Really, I, let me just go back a bit. Some of you are going to find this tonight interesting. Might not inspire you. It might not think, oh, that was great. That really tickled where it itched. But you will find it interesting. Is that Okay interesting so you won't be going out thinking oh that was awesome because he's done something to me in here it's just going to be interesting all right no we'll see so this this canon is developed through debate asking what various communities consider as being inspired writings and what is held uh, or given a particular status in a particular tradition. So there's people who get together and say, this is what we've 
had handed down to us over the, the centuries. This is what we uh, read about our ancestors. And, this, and so it's given opportunity to be included in what's called the canon, right? So there's another issue, though. It's based on whether a lot of people, and we're back to majorities again, accept it universally or they find it heresy. So if they find it heresy, they're going to exclude it. If a lot of people accept it, they're going to say that's universally accepted, so we'll put it in. Now, for me, I don't know about you, I find that a bit, bit weird. It's a bit like if you were to say, which is the best tomato ketchup in the world? Right, who shouted Heinz? Yeah, Heinz. But why is that? It's probably because the majority have decided that that's it. Now, there's other people out there who like different brands, you know, and they might think it's amazing, but you see, what, sorry? It's like baked beans. But we aren't getting off, off on that. So you see, we have to then look at what the word heresy means. Do you know that the word heresy, all it means is a choice? And we all use the word heretic or heresy when we think somebody is actually challenging a, a, a very uh, widely uh, held thing that we say, you can't go against what's been held precious for a long time. And you see what happened over the years, and I mean, Constantine had a, 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 a big hand in this, when he decided that his empire was flagging, and he says, you know, the best thing we can do here is actually yeah, convert every, everybody to, to, to Christianity. Basically, he got some people together to, to, to put together what their rules and regulations, I'm just trying to keep it simple, rules and regulations would be, and he said, yes, if you're a Christian, this is what you'll believe from now on, and anybody else who didn't, guess what happened to them? They were executed. And 250 years from Constantine doing what he did, there was over 25,000 Christians who they were uh, killed, not for doing anything wrong, but because they wouldn't hold to these, uh, this canon that was put in place. Now, just follow me a little bit. See, there's very uh, always a lot of motives when you put a thing together, isn't there? If you're thinking, oh, this will sound good, we'll put this together. Now imagine, if a king was going to put together something to say, this is what we're going to follow, you're bound to find that he's making sure that everything he said is going to look after him. Yeah? So this is why in like the King James Version... You've got things that are written and interpreted. They're actually saying, do you know what? I better be careful how this is written or some people might not obey me. So some scriptures are actually interpreted to suit the king when actually that's not what the original text said. Now you think, oh, this is, this is weird. This is too much. And that's why actually the Bible was never meant to be read alone. It was meant to be talked about in groups. And in fact, it was meant to be heard more than it was meant to be read because a spirit of a thing can come off the page rather than what words say. Now, you know that when you read a letter from someone, you can read words and you think, oh, it says that, but I feel this. Do <laughs> you get me? So it was meant to be heard. So anyway, there were many motives and agendas. And um, if voices threatened the, the common narrative uh, of what they believed that, that it should say um, in the, this canon, then of course they were, their voices were silent. Now it's interesting, there was a guy called Marcion, and some of you might have heard of him, but he was shut up and he had written a gospel and uh, ultimately, he, his gospel was rejected. And the reason why it was rejected is because he had, in essence, the audacity to suggest that Jesus in the New Testament was not representative of the God of the Old Testament. He said, these two people are not the same. And if you think about that, imagine somebody saying that the God of the Old Testament was not Jesus in the New. Imagine to a predominant uh, group of Jews, this was going to absolutely 
do them in. So they silenced him, all right, and said, you aren't getting your book in there. And there is so many that if you just Google it, see how many things were written by people, but they were rejected. Why? Because in their minds, this group, it didn't fit with the, what they felt was the story that would be, would be going through. Now, I find that really, really sad because, you see, this canon is what's called a closed canon. And I find that just unbelievable. Let me just explain what it means because uh, I've lost it somewhere, haven't I? Where is it now? Oh, hang on a minute. Where is it? There, here we go. It was a closed canon, meaning that nothing could be added and equally nothing could be taken out once it had been decided. Now, I just find that unbelievable if we are talking about a, a God who is, is living and actively in the now God, not one that was lost centuries ago. You, you've got the pro, and, and I'm being honest with you, I look then at the, the covers and I look at the pages between and think, how can that just be it? And then you get things like, you know, the dig up the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 19 whenever. But of course, whatever's written in there can't be considered scripture because it's a closed canon. Now, I find that just unbelievable. I don't know about you because I'm thinking, yes, I love the, the, the scripture, but the very fact that it's closed, it nearly does my head in. Because I'm thinking, how can you have a closed thing with, with a God that is just constantly life and always, let's say, wow. He's always wow. Yeah? So, it sounds awesome to have a closed canon on the one hand because you're saying, well, once it's set in stone, it's something that people can grasp and it's something that people can get behind. But at the end of the day, it becomes something that actually if we wanted to just put a sentence, it would be that it's potentially being said that it is the end of revelation. Think about it. Well, that's it. We've had the revelation. There's, no gonna be, there's not going to be a process of continuous revelation that we can... Now, you see, I wonder, and I, and I don't want to upset anybody, but I wonder if God actually wanted a Bible. Oh, I'm going to really be in trouble aren't I for that? Did God really want a Bible in the sense of things written down, set in stone, that then what do people do with that Bible? Be honest. They kill people with it, don't they? See, in the Old Testament, uh, we can give proof that Jesus, ne God never wanted a temple. Yet they built one. And we, I can find the scripture that says, you know, okay, well, if that's, if, they, if that's what you want to do, I'll, I'll accept it. But he didn't really want it. Why? Because it would create a situation where there would be those that were in and there'd be those that were out. Whereas God was saying, I actually want to dwell in you. I want to walk with you and I want to talk with you. I want it to be a relationship. But somehow we thought, oh, no, it'd be better if we have a, a building with doors on so it can be a closed place. Do you see the similarity? We can decide who we keep in and who we, we, we don't let in. Interesting. So listen, I'm not saying that it isn't good to have some things written down to encourage us, but when we get to the place where it becomes closed, and what about the fact that the Bible talks in the New Testament about us being living epistles? Where's all that gone? Where, where can the book of Chris be? Oh, you're looking at me really weird. But where's the, bu the book of Chloe? Now, you might say, oh, don't write a book about me. Now, listen, the, the thing is, we've got this idea that everything that was written is there. And we've said, you know, we've been told it's inspired, it's, it, it's inerrant, and it's, it's infallible, and all these things. But people were making mistakes. People were on their journey figuring stuff out. I'm on a journey figuring stuff out. You're on a journey figuring stuff out. So where's my book? Because it's still being written. So I am not dissing what we've got. I'm just wanting to encourage you. 
It's not finished. It's still being written by us. Now, there was so much excluded, um, and I can just go back a little bit. I said it was 500 years or so when it was uh, uh, put together finally, and it was a bit different from the, for the Catholic Church. It was a bit different for the one group here. It's all different for, ev- for everybody because some decided, we want that book included in ours, but others would say, others would say I'm not having that book included in, 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 in our sacred text. And you've got... People like Luther, Martin Luther, and you know, he's a name that comes up because of the Reformation in in 16 something or other. And he decided that he felt that Revelation, Jude, James, and Hebrews should not be included. That was Martin Luther. And we, we love Martin Luther. We think he's a great guy. But he'd got a bee in his bonnet about these books and says, I don't want them included in this. And Go and have a check at this. The German Bible still puts them at the end altogether because as far as Martin Luther, who was the great German reformer, he says, I'll put them, we'll have them in, but I'm going to show that I don't really like them. So they were put at the end. Isn't that interesting? Oh, I find this really interesting. Mm. Okay, so loads of books that weren't included. Now, there's a, a guy in... Um, in Genesis, who's heard of Enoch? Who knows the scripture off by heart? Come on, what's it that we learned? Enoch. You know, you're not very good. We ought to get back to super gang and, and learning scriptures because the kids used to be able to reel them off. Enoch, Enoch walked with God and was not because God took him. Now, what does that say about that man? It's pretty awesome. It's a wow. Something about Enoch made it so that he didn't actually die. Wow. Yeah? Did you know that he wrote a book? But because some people debated that he didn't write the book, it wasn't really him, then it wasn't going to be included in the canon. Yet Enoch walked with God and was not because God took him and people thought he didn't have anything to say. No, I don't know. Should it be included? Should it not be included? But you see, the thing is, has anybody bothered to read it? It's absolutely amazing. You find stuff in the book of Enoch that fills in gaps From Genesis, the Genesis haven't bothered to tell you. And you think, is this true? I don't know whether it's true or not, but I'll tell you what, it's interesting. Because you start getting information about stuff that you thought, oh, now that makes sense. Oh, when you look at it that way, oh, I didn't know that. And I would like to do a Bible study on some of this. Because I think you'd love it, what you'd have to, have to learn. But you'll have to come ready to blow some cobwebs out, yeah? But anyway, that's not what we're talking about tonight. But anyway, so you wonder why wasn't it included. But like I say, and I'm not going to go on, on any... Lo- oh, hang on. There's something weird here. Undo. Undo. Oh, is that... I'm no good at this, am I? <laughs> so where am I? There we are. I'm here. Okay, so I'm not sure that God really wanted a sacred text. And uh, I I believe that we really do, with God, have an open canon. And I believe that it's still been written. We are getting revelations now that we've never had before. It isn't closed. It's still happening. And we have got to be open because we can just like what we said about art last week, that we can get so hung up on what has been the thing that we've been handed that we never consider the breadth of what is on offer to us. So, two major revelations that I feel um, I have had over uh, the last 20 years, and it's this, that God is not who I thought he was, and the Bible 
isn't for what I thought it was for. Now, I don't know whether you get me there. But you see, if I look at the Old Testament, and this is how I was brought up, I was introduced to a God of the Old Testament and then basically introduced to Jesus in the New Testament who was supposed to be the exact representation of the Father. But then when I looked at the Old Testament, I struggled to see Jesus and the God of the Old Testament. I'm sorry, I just struggled. Yet what I did was accept it. I, 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 I received it because that what what... I was supposed to do. But I'll be honest with you. When I understood that I didn't have to, and some of you are going to freak when I say this, but some of you have heard it before. When I realized that the Bible wasn't a constitution or a rule book in the sense that it had been written so that I could basically obey every word that was said. It was the most freeing thing in the world because I recognized, well, do you know what this, 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 that makes sense. It is a collection of books that has been put together so that we might have insight into other people's journeys and other, other people's experiences and open ourselves up to say, do you know what? I am, I am wanting an experience with the true God of heaven, the Abba of Jesus, and I'm opening myself up for that. Now, do we see him in the Old Testament? Of course we do. But it seems that there's this other face that we see that doesn't seem to represent the Jesus of the New Testament. So, um, if he's the exact representation of the Father, that leaves me thinking that either through the Old Testament, God then changed his mind about some things and became somebody different and then had to sort of think, oh, well, I know I'm, I've done that and it didn't work, so I'm going to do this now. Or the picture that we have been given was the wrong one and God in there is desperately trying to get through and he couldn't because they'd all got these different ideas of, I mean, you know, you've, you've got to understand that, you know, uh, uh, Israel in the middle here, surrounded by Babylon and Assyria, great countries, Egypt, all had their own gods and their ritual things. And so they'd pulled from different areas and, and, and added to what they understood and, and, and knew. But the issue is somehow in it all, because I know, for instance, King David, you only have to read his story to know that he'd had an encounter with somebody who was very similar to Jesus of the New Testament. You can see it, can't you? It, it's different. So anyway, I want to bring a story because I'm going to just throw a question out to you. And, I, and I, it might just help you, and I hope it does. And I have to find it first on these little gadgets, which are weird, but I will do it. Okay, there's a story, and it's in Judges 11. And you don't have to put it up because it's only a few verses and I'm going to read it to you. Because it's things like this that concern me, right? Is that okay? Told you it was going to be interesting. Right. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then Jeff, Jeff went over to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from Aroa to the vicinity of Minith as far as Abel Keramim. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. So this is Jephthah who's gone out to fight the enemies of Israel, and he's basically done it. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was an only child except for her. He had neither son nor daughter. Then this is, I find this hilarious but wicked. Sorry, I've just got to give you it. The Gileadites, of which 
Jeff, Jeff the, was, captured the fords of the Jordan leading to Ephraim. And whenever a survivor of Ephraim said, let me cross over, the men of Gilead asked him, are you an Ephraimite? If he replied no, they said, all right, say Shibboleth. Sorry, that's why I find it funny. Try saying that. Shibboleth. If the person replied Sibboleth, because he could not pronounce the word correctly, they seized him and killed him at the fort, Fords of Jordan. 42,000 Ephraimites were killed at that time. Who can't say Sibboleth? Shibboleth, whichever. Shall we stand at the door and on your way out, if you can't say sh 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 Shib. It's laughable. It's laughable. But this, this is a story and it says, and the Lord gave the Am Ammonites into his hands. And the 42,000 were, were killed. What? Because the Lord... So I have to ask a question. Is it, was that the God of Jesus? I don't know. I'm asking. I'm just asking questions. Is that the God of Jesus? Was whoever that God was, you can make up your mind, was that God more concerned with Jephthah keeping his vow than murdering his daughter? I think that's a dead good question. You get me? Was God, whoever he was, more concerned with him keeping the vow than killing the daughter? Now, I just can't get my head around that. Especially if we're talking about him being the God of Israel, who'd already given the Ten Commandments through Moses. And what was one of those things? Thou shalt not... Oh... So, God's more con God is more concerned with the keeping of a vow than he is about the child that came to meet him. I don't know. I find that really. And we also know, and you find other scriptures that talks about the fact that God was totally against child sacrifice. It was other gods of nations who were doing that sort of thing. So, suddenly we've got it. Why after he'd got home and apparently he gave his daughter a couple of months to sort of go and make merry with her friends because she says, okay, then you can kill me. I mean, once she, all right. I mean, she basically submitted to it. But why in that two months wasn't God saying, you don't have to do that. Come on, don't be daft. And the business about just because a person couldn't pronounce shibboleth. Ha! Doesn't this make you think? Does me. But you see, if we read the Bible as a constitution, and I read that word, and I mean, people have said, oh, you know, read the Bible every day and get direction and this, that, and the Okay, I get up and I read that. What am I being taught? Am I being taught, first of all, make vows to God, because... You know, you can make them and God will actually fulfill them. But then once you make the vow, you better fulfill it, better keep it. And equally, that if, if, if I make it, God's going to be more concerned you keep the vow than the consequence of what that vow might create. Now, is that what I'm supposed to read there? Or am I supposed to have some wisdom and just say, do you know what? They've got their wires crossed there, haven't they? Haven't they got their wires crossed about who? Who was God? What did he, de he demand? Now, you see, I sometimes think that how we were brought up as well um, was to be very concerned about making vows to God. We used to see, sing songs that says, I'll sit, serve you for the rest of my days. You know, I'll do this, I'll do that or the other. And I'm thinking, heck, we used to say some stuff, didn't we? didn't we? Do you, ever, do you think that God holds us to that? See, it depends. In essence, it depends what sort of God you've got. 
And you say, I don't believe that he's like that at all. And you might say, oh, are you saying that, you know, God doesn't want to keep us, us to be, be good and true to our word? No, I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm trying to make you think about is how if you have been led to believe that basically God of the Old Testament, and we can justify him being this warrior God who basically indiscriminately just wiped out people, we then have a problem marrying that with Jesus of the New Testament. Right, so the other week I really felt that God put that on my heart to bring. And um, when I was um, just uh, thinking about tonight, I felt that, okay, if it's been laid on my heart, and I really do feel that, that God does speak, then I believe that there is a, there's people in here, or maybe just one person, who actually is They've got themselves in a mess because they believe that they've made vows to God and either they've broken them or by keeping the vows, they have really got themselves into a mess because of the consequence of the vow. Now, I'm just going with my heart and as I was sort of doing some uh, study and research, it was just interesting and I know it's 8.02, but just give me a few minutes because I really do believe this is, for, this is practical now. It's practical, okay. And um, this is a lovely book, The Mystery of Christ. Robert Farrah Kappen is a, he's a great writer and uh, he, he just has a lovely way of writing. But he's a, um, a priest and he also he, he has a pastoral care and he counsels people. And what he's done is put together various case studies of people who have come and this is one, and I couldn't believe by it well of course I can but you know it was like a, a bit of a shock so this woman goes to see him and um, she talks about all sorts of things and then she says this is really what I wanted to talk about now this lady don't worry when I then read about what she's done and what she's upset because if you guys say oh well I haven't done that so it's not a, it's not me it's not a problem if really you open yourself up to the Holy Spirit and it's something that you're really struggling with, something will just go poof and you'll get it. This is not specific, if you see what I mean, but I'm using it as a, an example. Does that, that make sense? So, listen to this. What I really want to talk to you about is something I did during the first week. For over a year now, I've been having an affair I've always hated that word. It sounds so detached and masculine, which wasn't the way I felt about it all. But anyway, back in there in the first week, when everything looked so black and I have to stop there, her daughter had been in a skiing accident and she was so badly injured, they thought that she was going to be in a vegetative state for the rest of her life. When everything looked so black, I made a promise to God. Or maybe it was a bargain with God, I don't know that if Barbara pulled through, I would end the affair. I suppose what I'm here for is to ask you whether now she's better, I really have to do something about the promise. Make good on it, that is. She stopped abrupt, abruptly. Uh, I let a few beats go by, then asked her, what do you want to do about it? Why'd you ask me that? If I knew what I wanted, I wouldn't be here, would I? Maybe, maybe not, I said but I think I need more to go on before I try to answer anything. Let me change the question a bit. What, if anything, have you done so far about ending the affair? Maybe we can get to what you want to do by the back door. Well, after it was clear that Barbara was going to be all right towards the end of the second week, Ted and I came back down here and I told the man I was involved with about my promise. Now that I listened to myself, I suppose I was asking him to make the decision for me just the way I was asking you a minute ago, or maybe I thought I could actually end the affair just by telling him about the promise. Suddenly she looked sad. Maybe I did for all I know. How so? What did he say? Well, he said, well, I love you and blah, 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 blah. So I'm still seeing him. Then I guess you haven't done it yet, have you? I guess not. You seem to, uh, I guess not, but I still need to know if I should. Don't I? He said, you have to be careful there. Let me ask you another question. You seem to have assumed that because you made a promise to God, you're bound to keep it. On what basis do you think that's true? She looked surprised. 
and probably you're looking surprised because you think, well, obviously, or whatever. But listen to this. On the basis that a promise to God is serious and ought to be kept, isn't that right? I love this. It depends on the kind of God you're dealing with. With most gods, that's the way the game is supposed to be played. But with the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I think not. You're saying that Christians don't have to keep their word to God? Not exactly. I'm saying that your promises to God, or my promises, or anyone else's, are not capable of getting us either accepted by God or damned by God. Acceptance according to the gospel is a free gift bestow on a world full of flower flushes. I don't know what they are, but that's his word. And it's given to them despite their flower flushing, right in the midst of their flower flushing. It's not a reward for hotshot behavior in the promise keeping department. And damnation is not a punishment for breaking promises to God or even for breaking the commandments of God himself. It's a consequence of stupidly throwing away the free gift of acceptance. I've heard you preach that, but where am I now? It seems either too good to be true or else just an excuse for getting away with anything you like. It always seems both, I said, but let me keep it anyway. Did you see the segment about Caligula, I, Claudius, on Masterpiece Theatre? Yes, Maybe not all of them, though. Well, you remember Caligula, a really nasty piece of work, arrogant, cruel, and very busy working himself up to being a god while he's still alive. Anyway, when Caligula is supposedly sick to death, one of the senators makes an extravagant vow to the gods. My life for Caesar's if he's spared. Caligula, of course, gets better. And when he meets the senator after his recovery... He first expresses admiration for the vow. But then he says, isn't there something wrong with this situation? If you offered your life for mine, we shouldn't both be here, should we? And he sends the senator off under guard to make sure he makes good on his vow by opening a vein. Think about that a little. You made a vow to finish off your lover if your daughter was spared. And now you want to know if you have to deliver on the promise. I said the answer depended on what kind of God you made the vow to. There's no question, of course, that if you believed in a Roman-style God or in almost any God other than the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, all of them rather nasty pieces of work, just like Caligula, the answer would be yes, deliver or be damned. But is that the kind of God you believe in? Now, see, I'm, I'm saying this is because we all think we know what kind of God we believe in. But I read that story from the Old Testament and we look at it and think, well, God, God blessed him. God gave him the Ammonites. So it must, that must be okay. But when we really get down to it, is that the God of our father, Jesus? Is, is it? So if you're going to be worried. Anyway, he then gets on to Jephthah. He actually brings him up in the book. This man I've been talking about. So anyway, he talks about that. But here's the thing. I just want to get to just... um, Anyway, she's balking at the fact this can't be right, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, This is it. Um, If you were to read only the first three fourths of the story of Noah, for example, you decide that God's prescription for sin is destruction. But if you keep reading... Uh, you find that that God's real last word on sin is the covenant rainbow in the sky saying he's never going to do the destruction bit again, which of course is exactly the case when you get to Jesus. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The New Testament says that God doesn't count our trespasses, that he has taken away the handwriting that was against us and nailed it to the cross. Not keeping a promise is just one more trespass. He's already got tacked up there. Don't you find that amazing? If you go on with the story, the woman couldn't release herself. She couldn't release herself at all. And he kept saying, but that's because the God that you're trusting in and believing in is not the God of Jesus. 
He then talks about, um, oh, I love this bit here. He says, uh, she's hoping that he'll answer the question for her and he won't. He says this, if we believe the gospel, adultery can't condemn us and just as important, not committing adultery can't save us. What saves us is the free forgiveness of Jesus, not our works, not even our good works. It's just, it's just wonderful. I see, I know some of you are saying, ah, oh, yeah, but you know, we should keep our vows. We should be this, that, and the other. What I'm trying to get over to you is the fact that in Christ, we have a father and a savior, which goes beyond, so beyond. And, and I'm bringing this to you because I really felt that what, what, what had been put on my heart is that there's some of you in here who you may have felt you've broken a vow because you made it at the altar of the church getting married. Something like that. And you're thinking, but I made a vow before God and I've, I've broken it. What am I going to do? And it's, it's eating you away. It doesn't have to. The guilt shop has been closed for good. And he's saying, you're free. You are free to, to, to move on. Now, depression and such uh, self-loathing comes when we have a belief that this God who is supposed to love us holds us uh, responsible and saying, you better come good on this. You better come good on this. You better come on good on this. Rather than actually saying, do you know what? Aren't I glad that I'm released from all of this because of his unconditional love? And I really believe that someone tonight uh, in this place, it might be more than one, um, who the word vow, it's something that you feel you struggle with, you, you feel you've broken that. I want you to be free tonight. I want you to have a freedom and I want you to know that the God of, of, of Jesus is somebody who, like it, let me just look at that line again, because I like that. It was about, uh, where is it? Here we are. Not keeping a promise is just one more trespass. He's already got tacked up there do we get it do we hear it or not i hope so because life's short and god wants you to live your life absolutely free from condemnation and i hope that uh, what has happened tonight even in what we've been talking about is helping you to see that if we're not careful we can actually look at the sacred texts and actually find that we're attached to not the God of Jesus, but actually something else that's probably an imagined, a, um, a, crea a created thing. We've created it because of what we've been handed down, just like the idea of art. So we're going to pray, and we're going to pray to Dad. We're not going to pray to God. We're going to pray to Dad. I just ask Father that... The words that have been spoken tonight will be releasing. They will set people free. And I just ask that you will be very close in the context of helping reveal um, some of these issues that people are in condemnation over. As people lay on their pillar tonight, will you just whisper into their ear, just like we said last week, louder than the voice that whispers uh, they're unworthy, you'll actually be whispering to their ear that nothing can separate them from your love. And I ask, Father, that as we move on and we learn more and we see more of you, that we'll understand uh, just the most incredible gift that we have been given, knowing Jesus, that in the flesh, he came in order that we might see fully who you were. And I just ask that we will be open, that we will not be closed in the context of a, a, a canon that can't have any more revelation, but we'll be open to know that you are 
constantly revealing and giving us more understanding. Uh, and on that basis, we're going to grow in you and be that um, through us, it will be shown, like we were singing earlier, through us, it will be shown because we've totally bought into and understood the love that you have for us. So I just pray a release now. All of those who feel incredibly guilty, who feel that they can't release themselves from situations of the past, I just ask, Father, that they will know a, a lifting of a burden, that they will understand that you're more concerned with them than you were about the vow and that it can be fixed because you're fixing stuff all the time and that's what you're great at. So I just thank you um, for being such a good dad and just bless everyone as we go. Teachers, just bless us in all that we do and we say thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all The Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others. <laughs>